And go ahead and have a seat again. Let's dismiss the Sunday schools and invite Pastor Jack up. Good morning and welcome. Last week we started looking at the topic of are you drifting? And it came out of a story that a gentleman named Billy Norris wrote and I'm going to tell you this story again for those of you that weren't here last week so you know how this message all fits together. But Billy Norris writes of this tra tragic event that comes from drifting. And he says, two young men were fishing above a low dam on a river near their hometown. As they were concentrating on catching fish, they were unaware that they had drifted until they were not far from the water flowing over the dam. When they realized their situation, the current near the dam had become too powerful for them to keep their boat from going over. Below the dam, the water was dashing with strong force over great boulders and through crevices within the rocks. Caught by the swirling waters under the rocks, they never came to the surface. And after days of relentless searching, the divers fa finally found one body and then three days later, they found the other. We were talking about drifting and how easy it is for every one of us if we're not watching over our hearts and taking certain precautions, how easy it is for us to drift. And last week I shared on things that we should know about drifting, that it requires no effort, that it's an unconscious process, that we never drift upstream or against the tide. The speed always increases. It's always dangerous to others. And it ends in shipwreck. And that story, as we relate it to the gentleman in the boat, is a warning for each and every one of us. We looked last week also at some common signs of drif drifting. Diminishing desire to study God's Word. And we pick up this morning with a diminishing desire to be with God's people. You see, as our hearts grow cold, or as the devil gives us opportunity and we encamp upon that opportunity, we start to lose a desire to be in God's Word. And as I mentioned last week, we don't have to look at this legalistically that everyone has to be, just like you don't have to eat every day. But I can tell you this, that if you don't eat for long enough, you're going to die. And the same is true spiritually, that we lose focus, we lose heart, and our heart becomes desensitized to God speaking to us. And so today we pick up on diminishing desire to be with God's people, and this includes not only some of the extracurricular or the extra different things that one might have going, like our Sunday evening gathering or uh, some of our picnics or some of our social gatherings, some of our outreaches, whatever they may be, but it also includes Sunday morning. You know, and I understand that people, you know, miss now and then. But what I exhort you to consider is are you drifting too much? Are you staying away too long? Is your heart starting to get deceived? One should always have the attitude, if you will, of the psalmist who says in Psalm 122 and verse 1, he says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. 
you know, our fellowship with one another in whatever the venue might be, our fellowship with one another is a gift from God. Us being together, learning to get past some of those little things that irritate one another. are going in love for one another, are encouraging and admonishing one another. You don't find that in many churches today. People come and they sit in a seat like you're sitting today, and then they get up and leave, and there's nothing. Oh, they might have friends within that church, even friends that they hang out with. But there's no real desire to get into a person's life more and help them to grow. In Romans 14 and verse 19, we see that fellowship with God's people extends beyond the service of the church. And it says, So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. And this type of edification really is something we need on a daily basis. Not that we have to go to church every day, but as brothers and sisters, we, can, we have the freedom and the liberty and maybe even the responsibility to call one another up and just say, how are things going? I'm reminded of the book of Hebrews when we're exhorted to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and let me read that to you just so that I don't miss anything. But it says here, <clears throat> Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That day drawing near is the return of the Lord. Our society is going to continue to get worse. Relationships between parents and kids, the ungodliness that permeates our society already and will continue to increase. And so we are exhorted by that author to consider, that means we have to use this up here, to consider how to stimulate one another. So as I look out over this group of people, some of you I know this about, and some of you I know that about, and uh, with different ones I would consider how to do it differently. I would encourage one one way and another one another way. But you see, we need to do that on a regular basis lest our hearts grow cold to the things of God. The right kind of friendship strengthens us, while the wrong kind leads us astray. It says in Corinthians that bad company corrupts good morals. And we tend to become like those that we spend the bulk of our time with. If it's with ones that encourage us and build us up, we will be encouraged and build up. If it's ones that hold us accountable. I was speaking with some gentlemen last night about memorizing the entire New Testament by a theme per book and a theme per chapter within each book. And as we hold ourselves accountable, we can grow. And as we spend the time together and encourage one another, we will grow and hopefully we can do those checks with each other to make sure that we're on track. But he tells us in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together and keep warm, how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And so we need 
that fellowship. And life, you know, we're, life was supposed to have begin, or be getting, if you will, simpler. We now have cell phones and we have computers and people go out to lunch or families get together and what do you see as they're sitting around the table? Everybody's on their own and they're not communicating, they're not understanding each other or seeking to understand each other or find out how somebody's week has gone. They're all off in their own little world playing games or, or reading articles. And that's not bad to a degree. And how many of you text people all the time and you don't call them? Do you realize we're losing the touch, that personal touch of hearing another's voice? You see, there's a subtlety about it that works on our hearts. And so we always have to be aware of that. There's also a diminishing desire to share the gospel. And if we really believe as Christians that there's coming a day when God is going to separate those who are saved and those who are lost, and the lost will go to a, an eternal place of torment, then what are we going to do about it? I'm sure that if we surveyed the room here, everybody's got family, friends, co-workers that don't know Christ. And as I tell people, if, if you're afraid to share the gospel with them, you get them to come to church and we'll share the gospel with them. Because people can't respond if they, know, if they don't know that there's something to respond to. One gentleman that I read about in... France many years ago was condemned to die and on the day that they walked him to the gallows the priest that was walking alongside him told him that he could know Christ and his sins could be forgiven and he said do you really believe that to which the response was yes he said, if I believed that, he said, I would crawl on my hands and knees across this nation on glass to tell people. Gives us something to think about, doesn't it? Because oftentimes those that we say we love, for fear of offending them or maybe damaging our relationship, we keep silent. And what that will amount to is you'll spend, rather than being separated if they get upset for a short while here on earth, because our life is but a breath, it's but a vapor, it's but a blade of grass, and it's here today and gone tomorrow. And we might lose their friendship for that short period of time, but if they make a decision will enjoy their fellowship for all eternity. If they don't make that decision, we'll enjoy them for a few more years and they'll suffer for all eternity. I've often asked people that say that they're afraid to share the gospel. I said, what would you think? What would you think if you had the cure? You're no, you're no doctor, you're no medical scientist or anything else, but somehow or another you came up with a cure for cancer that we know is killing many. And as you stood and looked at your cure, you thought, well, I know there's a lot of people dying, but if I tell them, they'll think I'm a wacko. They'll say, well, you're not a doctor, you're not a scientist, you don't know anything about medicine, why should I believe you? And so out of fear, you take your private little cure for cancer and you put it on the shelf up in the closet. What would you think of that individual? And inevitably, from everybody that I've shared that with, with 
they've said, I'd think you were a horrible human being. And I said, well, we have the cure for what ails, the cancer that ails the world, the cancer that is eating away at men and women's soul. When we look around us, the abortion, the murders, the rapes, the robberies, the thieveries, all of the various ills, if you will, in our society, we have the cure for. And if we don't take it out, how will they ever know? And how will they ever have the opportunity to respond? Diminishing desire. You know, when one obeys the gospel, comes to Christ in faith, he knows his sins have been blotted out and that he has made a new creature. And God starts a work within the heart of that individual. And so he has in the hearts of many of you or maybe all of you here today. But he begins a work to change you, not to give you necessarily more knowledge, because knowledge itself puffs up, but to give you a new character, a new nature, that as we grow, we would start to resemble the Lord Jesus Christ more and more. He says in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, Therefore, those who have been scattered went about preaching the word. And in Titus 1.8, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. When a Christian no longer has a desire to share with other people, we may well be on the verge of drifting and drifting and drifting. No one has to try. It's the natural flow of our nature, our fallen nature. But to live a Christian life, we have to guard our hearts. He tells us in Proverbs chapter 4 that we are to watch over our heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. We have to watch over, we have to garrison, we have to build that fortress around our heart from the influences of the world that will slowly steal our heart and turn us away. So consider here a couple of remedies, if you will, for drifting. One is to keep rowing. Keep rowing. Spe spiritually speaking, this involves diligence on our part. The Christian life is not an easy life because you're going against the tide in our society. You know, I remember reading the Telegraph Herald, which is now a very liberal newspaper here in Dubuque. I remember reading in the late 1800s when Fred Sr. was at the helm, they had a list of requirements for each and every employee. You had to fill your own coal bucket before you left work at the end of the day. You were expected to work 12 hours a day. And he went through a list and there's no dating Unless you're, date, unless you're taking your date to church. And you're only given some time off to go to church, or time off, like on Wednesday night, as if you're going to church. Then they'll release you early from your 12 hours. So their standards were quite different back then. And I can guarantee you that they didn't go from here to here overnight. There was a slow drifting that took place in the hearts 
of those that were at the helm. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. And that list goes on, which you can read later in 2 Peter chapter 1. But these are things that we should, in a sense, use as a, as a guide. Because as it goes through that list, it says that if, if we are moving forward in these areas, if each one of these areas is increasing in our life, it'll render us useful, not useless to the Lord. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. That's right at the end of that list. You see, we have to have, in a sense, we have to have a blueprint for our life. What does being mature in Christ, how do we determine if somebody's mature in Christ? It's not by the fact that they've been saved for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years or whatever, but it's how much they resemble Jesus. What does their heart change to? from what it was to what it is now. It also means that we have to keep abounding in Christian graces. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, here's where the rest of those come in. It says, Now for this very reason also applying all diligence, in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of my granddaughters said something to me about uh, love one Sunday when I was talking and sharing, emphasizing love, and, and it was about basically, why do you talk about love so much? Well, if you read through the New Testament, look at how much Jesus, who is the living word, talked about love. Go through the epistles. Go through the entire New Testament and look, about, look at how much they talked about love. Why? Because as he informed his disciples, all of the laws summed up in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Lost neighbor, saved neighbor. Okay? And think about it. If we're loving one another, we're not gossiping about each other. We're not lying to each other. We're not committing adultery with somebody else's wife. And that list goes on and on and on. And so the goal is that we would be lovers, if you will, of people with the love of Christ. You know, there's no place, really, for retirement in the Christian life. We might retire from our jobs, but we don't retire from our walk with Christ. I've told my wife, when I die, we're going to have a party. I won't be there physically, but I want everybody to celebrate and have a grand time, because I know where I'm going. In fact, I even told her to send out invitations to some that I don't know if they'd come otherwise. No, RV, no RSVPs needed. Just come because there's something you have to know that happened to me. In Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 to 15 it says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, 
but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal it also to you. And in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore do not let us lose heart, but though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. You know, there's a tendency that, a trap I think that we could all fall in, into. And remember that it says in Romans that all fall short of the glory of God. There's a trap, I believe, that we can fall into that could sort of push us into that over-relaxed attitude. We look back. Paul didn't look back. We can look back at, our, at all of our failures in our life and that can discourage us and we quit walking as a result of that. Or we can look back and bank on all of our uh, prior successes. Look at this that I did, God. Boy, I'm a good servant. We can look at what we've accomplished and it can potentially lead us to pride. But if we can keep running the race, as it says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, if we can keep running the race set before us with our eyes upon Christ, eyes upon Christ, not about accomplishments, not about all of the other things in life that tend to press in on us, not about our failures, but we look to Christ. My failures have been covered by the blood, but I press on. And there's times when discouragement knocks at my door. And when I sense myself getting discouraged, I have to get up, put my boots on, and get back in the battle. None of us are exempt. We have a real enemy. And as I've said before, and I say again by way of reminder, this, this weekend we're celebrating, if you will, Memorial Day. And... Paul and Timothy, they, they speak of being a good soldier for Christ. And when you're in the military, if you're out on the battlefield or someplace where you're fighting one of those wars, or conflicts as some say, to me if a bullet's coming at you, I don't care if they label it a war or a conflict, it's still war. But you're out fighting and when you're on mission, they send your patrol out, and you're going out into hostile jungles or wherever it might be. The only thing everybody's thinking about is accomplishing the mission and getting everybody back alive. No man left behind. But there's something peculiar that happens when you come back to base camp you're not on mission anymore. It's sort of a chill time. And then this guy that you labored with yesterday, his jokes are so lame. And this guy, he's the wrong color. And this guy, he's too religious for me. Or too vile for me. And we start to find all kinds of little things that come in and start to embitter the heart and cause us to struggle. You know, it's a lot like that in the Christian life. If you find that you're struggling with other people, get back on mission. God has a calling on your life. God has a purpose for you. And as long as you're on mission, you'll fight together with everybody in here 
And all those small things, they don't matter at all. But if you're not on mission, you're going to have a hard time. I've said before, I can love anybody. I don't care who they are, I don't care what they've done. And why? Because I choose to. Because God says, love your wife. He says, love your brothers and sisters. Love the lost. Love your enemies. Well, if it's a matter of feeling, none of us could love our enemies. It's a matter of choice. It's an act of the will. And so everyone in here can choose love with their Christian life. And you know, one of these days I'm going to die. I don't know what day that's going to be. And I can say that this morning because my granddaughter's not in here. When I mentioned it one day in front of her, she, she went a little berserk. She didn't want Grandpa to die. But the reality of life is we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And when we do, what are we going to take out of this world? What are you going to take with you? Nothing this world offers but the hearts and souls of men and women that follow you as a result of your relationship with Christ. That's all to the glory of God. That's what our lives are about. Giving him the glory that he is so worthy of. We also have to watch out for undercurrents. We always have to be aware of the undercurrents of temptation. They can sweep us away. In 1 Peter 2, in verse 11, it says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. And in Galatians 5, 16 to 18, it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We have to watch out. We have to be ever aware of the undercurrents of temptation because they're there every day. Another one is expect to go against the tide. If you're a Christian and you want your life to count for God, expect to go against the tide. The tides sweep us away. Consider popularity, peer pressure, the praise of others, modernism, skepticism, humanism, denominationalism, false doctrines of all kinds, liberalism, worldliness in the church, which is probably the greatest enemy in the church in our lifetime. Neglect, indifference, indifference. That's one that's very subtle. Apathy, lack of interest, lack of concern. And the one who drifts along with the majority of those in our society and maybe even a lot of Christians, we're going to drift. We'll start to drift. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad and that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, but few are those who find it. I don't know how many God's few is, but I definitely want to be in that number. And I want to do all that I can while God puts, keeps breath in my body to build up 
and encourage and strengthen the saints to reach lost people and that God would somehow or another be glorified in my body and life, whether by the way that I handle things when I'm in opposition or the way that I handle things when I'm in pain. And you know, we're all in pain at times, aren't we? I remember when I first got out of the service and I was still in my brace from my knees up to my armpits. And, and I, was a, I wasn't a believer then, but I was cranky because I was in pain every day. And that hasn't changed much over the years. But I remember very clearly what my dad said to me. He set me down in the kitchen and he said, Jackie, he said, I don't understand the pain that you're in or what you're going through, but you have no right to take that out on everybody else. Stop and think about it. We have no right to take something out on other people because we're going through a hard time or a trial or pain. Expect to go against the tide. And the last one here in the remedies is we need to have strong anchorage. We need to have, if you will, be rooted and grounded in Christ. In fact, if I were to ask you right now, if I stood up here and said, I don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, how many of you could defend that? I'm not looking for a show of hands. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But how many of you could defend that? You'd know where to go in the Scriptures. And I pick on that one because that's the foundation of our faith. There are many other areas that we could be challenged in. But that's foundational. Every cult out there, every group that is against true Christianity, they differ on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we ought to be able to defend that. It says... In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind or doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love again. We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. We need to keep possessing, if you will, holding on with a very tight grip to that unshakable hope that lies within us. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, it says, in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We may have a strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge and laying hold of the hope set before us, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, going into the Holy of Holies. Your anchor will hold when we grab on to Christ and we keep Him before us, when we keep our eyes on Him. So I'd ask you as we close this morning, are you drifting? Is there an area of your life that maybe I mentioned or maybe I didn't mention, but God has made aware to your heart that you're drifting? The danger is real. 
It can happen to any one of us. And as we are exhorted, take, uh, take a stand. And I'm misquoting this verse, I know I am. But take a stand when you think you, or when you think you stand. Can you help me out, Steve? Yes, thank you. That's what happens. Thank you for saving me from drifting, Steve. <laughs> you know, there are signs, are there signs, I should say, of drifting in your life? We need to honestly ask ourselves these questions. Is my desire to study and be in God's Word and to pray, is that diminishing? Have I found it easy to make excuses why I don't need to talk with him in prayer and him talk to me through his word? Is my desire to be with God's people not what it was in the past? Have I lost my desire, if you will, to save those who are lost? Has my heart grown cold? You know, I've been sharing the gospel since 1973. And I still get fearful at times. But I still do it. Why? Because this individual's soul is at risk. So don't let fear stop you. I am, at, am I too much enamored by the things of the world? I remember reading about how they trap monkeys. They put something real shiny on one side of a hole that the monkey sticks his arm into reach, but once he grabs onto it, he won't let go and he can't get his hand back out. So it's a real easy thing. They go over and they pick up the monkey and he's caught. And you know, the things of the world are like that. All these sparkly little things that we can become so enamored with. And the devil just walks over and he picks us up and walks off with us. Because we've fallen, we've drifted. And I don't personally think anybody falls into sin. I think it's a drifting into sin. Because nobody goes from walking with Christ to walking with the devil that quick. It happens slowly with our hearts. From being hot for God to being cooler, cooler, lukewarm, and then ice cold. There's a progression. So I'm going to leave you with this verse this morning. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him. Life is short at its longest. You only have one shot at it. You only have one shot at raising your kids. You only have one shot at living a life that can bring glory to God. So I admonish you that if, if you found yourself drifting, if God has spoken to you the past couple of weeks here, get alone with him and get it straightened out. And get your eyes back on the Lord Jesus Christ and run the race that is set before you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we 
We indeed want to thank you this morning for our time together. I thank you for each one here today. We pray a special blessing upon any visitors that are here with us. We ask God that if you have addressed areas in anyone's heart, or if you may do it in the near future, Lord, that would show them that they're drifting, I pray that you would not let go, that you would not stop until they have repented and turned to you. Father, help us to watch over our heart with all diligence as we know, Lord, that from the heart is life and death. And so, Father, help us to watch over our heart, giving all diligence to it, for from it flows the springs of life. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.